So if you open your Bible to Isaiah chapter 1, you come to the, the final section of what Isaiah has to say in this first vision from God, this first uh, message from God. You come down to verse 27, and you, you pick up the narrative here. Where it says that Zion will be redeemed with justice, and her repentant ones with righteousness. But transgressors and sinners will be crushed together, and those who forsake the Lord will come to an end. Surely you will be ashamed of the oaks which you have desired, and you will be embarrassed at the gardens which you have chosen. For you will be like an oak whose leaf fades away or, or as a garden that has no water. The strong man will become tender, his work also a spark. Thus they shall both burn together, and there will be none to quench them. If you're looking at this passage, one of the things that should come to your attention, one of the things you should highlight consider is, what is it I'm putting my trust in? When all of life falls apart, when everything goes wrong, where do I look to for help? For a lot of us, you know, honestly, we look at our friends or we, we look for uh, science. We look for science to give us an answer uh, to what we want to hear. We look to political leaders. We look to all sorts of sources other than God. Uh, if we're honest, and we can admit it to ourselves, we see uh, this, this natural tendency to not just abandon God when things go wrong, but to also replace him with something else. We always have to do this. We have to replace God. We can't just forsake him. We have to replace him in one form or another. We always worship something. So in our, our passage here, it opens up with speaking of Zion, Zion speaking of Jerusalem of uh, the whole uh, city proper. Uh, it was a simple term that actually became a larger term, talking of the, the entire uh, city of Jerusalem. Zion was a special name, a poetic name for Jerusalem, that beautiful city where righteousness was to dwell. God is quite upset, thoroughly upset with Israel for their not living up to their purpose statement, to their meaning. And we've looked at the indictments against them against the, the case against the nation of Israel that was supposed to be the beautiful city. It says here in verse 27 that Zion will be redeemed with justice and her repentant ones with righteousness. Well, who's going to be the one redeeming the city? Uh, it's not clear if it's speaking directly of God himself or the actions of the people. God has been, he's been proclaiming to the people that they need to do justice. They need to do righteousness. They need to follow after him in simple obedience, what, cleaning their hands of their filthy ways. You know, it, it's very similar to what we read in other places in the Bible where it tells us that we need to draw near to him and he will draw near to us. So this isn't a new concept. So who is the one that's redeeming? Well, God has to be the, the first cause in all of that as always. But he's also encouraging the people to do their part, to do what they're supposed to do, to walk in righteousness. One way to say it is that humanity, as it chooses to do what God makes possible, what, he's a, what he has paved the way for, then the people will be redeemed and restored. The nation of Israel will be restored as they follow after God, as they follow after his truth and walk in obedience. But then in verse 28, the God who has defined himself, not just as gracious, not just as long-suffering, he also says that he will repay sinners. He will deal with them for their sin. He won't allow the guilty to go unpunished. So then you come to verse 28 after looking at this wonderful uh, encouragement that God's going to uh, redeem his people and not just redeem them in some small way, but with justice and righteousness. He says then in verse 28, but transgressors and sinners will be crushed together. And those who forsake the Lord will come to an end. Now, for just a second, try to imagine a world without sin. Can you even do it? Uh, I can in theory. I get the idea. Uh, just like I can imagine eternity. I can imagine the concept. But when I start trying to play out the reality of it, it's, it's impossible. Everything in our world is tainted and marred by sin. It's mangled by sin in some way. So to imagine a world where sin is actually completely removed from it, I don't know that I can even get there. What a glorious thing to think about, to, to ponder. 
for a little while to help me live as I ought. So he looks at the transgressor and the sinner. He's using two different synonyms, speaking of the, uh, the wicked, self-righteous in Israel. They think they're, they're quite proud of themselves and for their so-called religion. The problem is they haven't just forsaken God, as I was saying earlier. They've also replaced it. And so they have a partial allegiance, a partial obedience to God, which is where God's anger really comes into play. He says, surely, in, in describing after the forsaking they did in verse 28, he then says, verse 29, surely you will be ashamed of the oaks which you have desired. There was a common theme of, of running after idols and they had to make their idols out of wood and they would make it out of even sacred wood like an oak tree. And the, the oak trees were quite common for the pagans to carve into their gods and to craft into their gods. And Israel has become that, a nation that is false, a nation that has more than one God, whether they're willing to admit that or not. So here God is saying, look, you've, you've put your hope when everything is going to go wrong in Israel. You've put your hope not in God Almighty, not in the one who, who gave you life and gave you opportunity. You're going to be putting your hope in these other gods. This is where you've run to for help. This is where you've gone. Where will they be in your time of need? Where will they go? Well, if they're going to these, if they have gone to these gods, God's saying when his punishment comes, they will be ashamed. They will be embarrassed by the gods they've chosen because they realize they have no power. He says, surely you'll be ashamed of the oaks which you have desired and you will be embarrassed at the gardens which you have chosen. They've run after trees. Fascinating thing. The God who made the trees and, and chose Judah, Israel, this nation, the same nation that knows this reality of the creator is now going to run after trees and worship trees. That's the illustration, the, the motif that's picked up here. So they, they're, they're going to be embarrassed because they realize what they believed in was no God. It had no power to save. It's as foolish as he says later in chapter two, as putting your hope in mankind whose breath of life is in their nostrils. They can't contain, they can't control life and their, and their ending. What a false hope. What a false trust to have. You will now be betrayed by the thing you thought could save you. What a sickening feeling that must be. So they further, they learn in verse 30 that for you will be like an oak whose leaf fades away or as a garden that has no water. The, the ability for these things to be able to sustain themselves will be gone. They're, a garden with no water is going to shrivel up. It's going to dry up. It's going to become worthless. The oak tree, that, as it's dying, its leaves wilting away is the picture that's drawn for us here. And what we have is a picture drawn for us of the unholy, unrighteous sinner and his idol that's going to be, as he says now, burned up together. He says, verse 30, for you'll be like an oak whose leaf fades away or as a garden that has no water. Now, continuing this motif, the strong man will become tender and his work also a spark. So as everything dries out and dries up, what's going to be left? Well, all it's waiting for, when a forest is dried out, all it's waiting for is a spark. The wood's already there. The wood here in this illustration, this metaphor, are the idolatrous people of Israel and their work the things that they have done, that's going to be the spark. And what happens, what is pictured for us is both of those things, the idolater and his idol are going to be burned up together. The strong man will become tender. You're just going to be kindling in a fire. And his work, this idol, will be a spark. And thus both shall burn together and there'll be none to quench them. So what have you put your trust in? What do you put your hope in? What do you hope will deliver you 
when you can't deliver yourself. Some trust in men, some trust in medicine or psychologists or whatever when life goes upside down. But as for us, as for we, the people of God, we will put our trust and our hope 